The War of 1812 fought not just only in 1812, but also 1813 and 1814, and kind of 1815, but not really. So, why are we fighting this war? Well, we're fighting it because the British are still impressing our sailors. The British are still over here in North America uh, arming the Native Americans. Um, and they, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, we, we don't really have a lot of reasons. The British are upset with us because we are encroaching Canada and also we are, uh, we're harassing some of their ships as well. We're going to cite uh, the Chesapeake uh, Leopard Affair. They're going to cite some other uh, naval battles that are taking place. So it's, well, there you go. Now, uh, we can argue that we probably shouldn't have gotten into a war. I mean, really? I mean, really? The country was divided. The New England states were absolutely anti-war. They were pro-British. Remember, we have the pro-British faction in the north. We have the pro-French uh, pro uh, uh, group in the south. So the New England states did not want a war. And ultimately, there was no, you know, burning sense of outrage. Yes, the Chesapeake Leopard uh, naval battle, that was a situation, but it was one, it was one battle, the ship, the ship, it was done. And so, I mean, there wasn't taxation without representation and stuff like that. There wasn't, you know, the, the intolerable acts or the Boston Tea Party or the massacres. Or... Our army, oh, yeah, remember Thomas Jefferson? had uh, removed a whole bunch of the, of the uh, monies from, from our military, so our army was not that great powerful army that George Washington had. Um, so there you go. It was ill-disciplined, ill-trained. Uh, we didn't have big names as our, our generals. I mean, General Washington, General Gates, General, no, they're all, they're all dead. So we don't have anybody. Well, we got this one guy down the south. We'll get to him later. And then, Ultimately, we have a faction of people in the Congress, uh, the War Hawks from the South, and they're going to push for war, push for war, push for war, push for war, and then we're going to declare war, and then they're like, okay, well, we've done what we were going to do, <laughs> and then nothing happens after that. So, the best defense is good offense. Wait, best offense is good defense? The best defense for us is the good offense. We're going to invade Canada because it worked out so well the first time. Uh, so we're going to try it again. And instead of concentrating our attacks on you know uh, uh, one big army and attacking, uh, we're going to divide our <laughs> our ill-trained troops into three smaller armies and attack Canada at once. That's a good plan. Divide your forces. <sighs> Didn't work for us. We attacked. Uh, let's see, we attacked over at Detroit, in, uh, near the Great Lakes stuff, uh, Fort N uh, Niagara, um, again, uh, near the, uh, uh, the Great Lakes, and then we're going to attack up uh, by Lake Champlain. And none of those worked. So yes, we invaded Canada again, and nothing. We did have some success out there on the Great Lakes, probably uh, well, one of the top three stories uh, coming out of the War of 1812 is uh, uh, Admiral Oliver Hazard Perry. So a lot of cool stories coming off some of his battles. Uh, obviously the United States is going to be on the south side of the lake, of Lake Erie, and the Canadians, the British, are going to be on the north side of the lake, and so there's stories about how they can, you know, uh, they're trying to build fleets as fast as they can um, on the opposite sides of the lakes. So as soon as they can get their fleets built, that they can come over and try to, you know, kill each other. Some crazy stuff. Uh, Oliver Hazard Perry is going to be in command of uh, the USS Lawrence, uh, named after uh, his friend who was killed on the Chesapeake. So he's going to uh, go up against uh, several British ships uh, in the middle of the lake, and his ship is going to be, uh, the USS Lawrence is going to be, uh, ooh, it's not going to be good. So uh, the British are going to come over, they're going to demand his surrender, and he allegedly says that, no, I'm not going to give up my ship. So he immediately gets, <laughs> he immediately gets in a rowboat with, with the priest and the purser, the only two guys who still can 
row. And he rows over to another ship and takes command of another ship, another American ship, and then uh, tells that captain, go go solve other problems. And then he takes his second ship and he goes up and he beats the British. And so just kind of a weird, weird battle plans. But the quote is, <clears throat> the quote is, we have met the enemy and they are ours. Uh, Admiral Perry sending a letter to uh, General William Henry Harrison uh, saying that we have met the enemy and they are ours. And so we captured several British ships. So, hey, go America. So we're going to go ahead and try to invade uh, uh, Canada again a couple of times and nothing's going to work. The reason we're going to invade Canada is because we're thinking, you know, right now the British are occupied in the 1812 and 1813. They're fighting Napoleon. Napoleon's over there, you know, crushing Europe. And so everything's going great and everything's going wonderful because the British can't really help the Canadians out. And then, uh, you guys know from world history, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's going to lose at the Battle of Waterloo. And suddenly the British have all the time in the world to do nothing. Oh, let's send a whole bunch of troops that are now doing nothing. Let's send them over to Canada. Oops. So they're going to come over to Canada, and the Brits are going to come up with a brilliant plan. They're going to divide their forces too. So they're going to attack a couple of different ways. They're going to attack uh, coming down from the north. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, they're going to choke off the Mississippi River, they're going to attack New Orleans, and that's going to stop all of our trade. That, that's plan one. Plan two, they're going to attack right up the Chesapeake uh, Bay area, so that's Virginia and Maryland and, and Washington, D.C. And plan three, they're going to come down from the north, down uh, through uh, Lake Champlain and the Hudson River and cut off the New England from New York. So they've got a plan. We start, if we start up north, uh, the British are going to come down through uh, New York and uh, kind of like we had the Battle of Saratoga in the last war where we defeated the British, we're going to have the Battle of Plattsburgh. The Battle of Plattsburgh. This is the key battle in the north that the British are going to be stopped. And they are stopped mostly because um, their, their, uh, their naval... Uh, support is going to be defeated out there in the lake. And so if you don't have naval support, then you can't get supplies, etc., etc. And so ultimately the British are going to have to turn around. And so their north campaign coming down uh, down to cut off the New England states is not going to work. And again, I know I'm doing this incredibly fast, but this is not military history class. Uh, so I'm just kind of hitting the highlights. So the Battle of Plattsburgh. <clears throat> Probably the most interesting story to me is that we have uh, uh, <laughs> the British are successful coming up to the Chesapeake Bay, and they're going to come into Washington D.C. So President Madison, right? Uh, President Madison is going to uh, they're going to have a battle outside of Washington D.C. President Battles uh, President Madison and his cabinet are going to realize D.C. is going to fall, and so they leave. And do I have a they, they, they run off to this little bitty town just outside of Washington, D.C., um, and, uh, and stay the night. The British are going to show up, and they're going to start burning the buildings. In fact, they burn the Capitol building, and they're going to burn the White House. Now, one of the stories coming out of this is that Dolly Madison, Pre uh, First Lady Dolly Madison, uh, uh, she's writing a letter as the, the troops are coming into Washington, D.C. She's writing a letter to her sister saying... I am not going to leave the White House, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not leaving the White House until I can save the, the giant eight-foot-tall painting of George Washington. So the famous painting of George Washington where he's kind of standing there looking all George Washington-y. Um, and so the problem was is that that particular painting in this big frame was bolted, bolted to the wall. The troops are coming down the street, and the painting is bolted to the wall. And she says, I'm not going to leave until I can get that painting. So uh, one of the servants and, and the gardener uh, eventually take axes, and they start to hack, hack the, uh, the frame. <coughs> Excuse me. They hack the frame, 
and they get the they get the painting out of the frame because they can't they can't carry everything, so they get the painting out of the frame, and she hands it to two uh, Americans, uh, two American soldiers, and basically she says, look, or if you if you get captured, you make sure you destroy this painting because even though I'm saving this painting, we do not want to take to get in the hands of the British, and good news. The painting was saved, and she, some stories say, she was walking out the back door as the British were coming in the front door of the White House. So, there you go. Dolly Madison saves the painting. Now, the second interesting story about the burning of the White House, is, or the burning of the Washington, D.C., is this. Uh, the British show up, and according to different reports, um, some say that the British were there and they were, gonna, they were going to... Uh, destroy the White House and the Capitol building, and then basically save everything because they were going to move in and they're going to occupy it. And then other reports say that some of the commanders had basically told the troops, no, raise, raise, R-A-Z-E, raise the city, which means clean it out, just totally cut the whole thing down, make it so that there's no more city. Um, and that's what a lot of people, are, that's, that's the majority of the opinion of what they were told. So, uh, good news good news. Providence smiles down on the Americans as the British are out there and they're starting to burn the city um, and not just the Capitol and the White House but other places like the Library of Congress. Uh, here comes this storm. Now obviously we don't have weather forecasts and, and you know people people who were doing you know people who are recording uh, data uh, they're leaving they're leaving because the British are coming. Uh, uh, but now we think that it was probably a hurricane so the hurricane comes through Washington, D.C., and the hurricane spawned a tornado that came basically right down Main Street of Washington, D.C. Uh, reports both Americans and British say that the, hur that the tornado picked up a couple of cannon and threw the cannon uh, several feet. Um, so British soldiers and American citizens were killed by the storm, and uh, the British uh, left because they didn't want to be out there in the middle of the elements. So it's an interesting argument that th there's a storm, that the storm that saved Washington, D.C., because, you know, all the, all the water came out and put out all the fires. Now, uh, a couple interesting things about that. Uh, tornado, the tornado showed up. Since, since that happened in 1814, there have only been seven, according to my research, only seven tornadoes in Washington, D.C. since. In 204 years, 205, however many, how, I mean, 206 years, there have only been uh, seven tornadoes since then. So tornadoes don't happen in Washington D.C. too often. Again, it must have been Providence that, uh, that that's the big that's the big word for God. Uh, it must have been God for uh, God showing up saying, "Nope, we want to kick the British out." And there you go. Of course, also it's a hurricane, so it also destroyed several buildings itself. But you know. Beggars can't be choosers. Anything else? Uh, yeah, so Washington was under British control for only 26 hours before they left. Uh, the storm uh, battered a lot of their ships, and so they had to repair their, the ships as well. The poor British. Uh, and then, again, the Library of Congress was burned to the ground, and looking down the road, good news, good news for all of you bibliophiles out there. Thomas Jefferson, uh, ex-president Thomas Jefferson, ex so it would be Mr. President, right? Mr. President Thomas Jefferson, he is going to save the day, and basically he's going to donate his personal library, many of the books of his personal library, to start a brand new Library of Congress. Go Jefferson. Francis Scott Key, a lawyer, is going to be, uh, he's going to uh, attempt to negotiate uh, some, the release of some prisoners. So on the uh, HMS Tonnant, September 13th and 14th. So uh, he shows up and he's going to he's going to negotiate and they can't uh, with with the with the other people with the British and uh, they can't come up with a decision. And so this particular ship is part of the bombardment of Fort McHenry. And so uh, so Francis Scott Key says, "All right, well I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and go." And the British captain says, "No." He, he, you can't go because if you if you leave, then you're going to tell you know the the Americans that uh, we're we're coming in. So uh, we're we're not keeping you. You're not a hostage, but uh, we are going to we're going to ask you to stay nicely. We're going to ask you to stay overnight with us on the ship. 
So the bombardment of Fort McHenry, and so uh, very famous, the, uh, the flag, right, is flying. And so the flag is flying uh, all day on the 13th, and then that evening as the twilight shows up and the sun goes down, they can still see the flag. And so then throughout the night, there's, you know, there's bombs going off and there's, there's rockets going off. And as the bombs are going, then they're able to see the flag, which is still standing uh, in the light of the bombs. And then, uh, you know, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of uh, soot and dust and smoke. And so the question for Francis Scott Key was, in the morning when the sun comes up, is the flag still there? Because if it's still there, that means that Fort McHenry survived the evening assault, the, the night assault. And if it's not there, if it's now a British flag or the, or the American flag is down, that means that they surrendered. So he was asking a question. And so uh, the story says that he wrote, he wrote this down on a napkin, right, or on a sheet of paper, not, not much bigger than a napkin. And so he says, Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light, the morning light, what so proudly we, what so proudly we, nah, nah, by the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars, oh yeah, look at that, it's the Star Spangled Banner, and the rocket's red glare, and the bombs bursting in, right, 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 that whole thing, and so the whole, that, the entire American, the first verse of the Star Spangled Banner is a question, oh, say, can you see the flag, is it still there, over the, over the land of the brave and the home of the free, right? So it's a question. And so that's how we got, that's how we got that. He wrote that down, and uh, he, he released that. Uh, when, when he was released, uh, he, he wrote out three other verses, so there are a total of four verses. Yeah, that's right, there's more verses to the, to the uh, Star Spangled Banner. And he called, he wrote it, he wrote the poem, and he called it The Defense of Fort McHenry. And then several years later, Thomas Carr put it, the words to... Uh, the poem to the tune of Anacreon of Heaven, which uh, those of you who have sung Star Spangled Banner know that uh, it's got a pretty good range of, what is it, 13 or 14 notes. Uh, so it's difficult for some people to sing simply because the oh say, and then na 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 na, you know, okay, I'm not going to do that for you. Although, no, I'm not going to do it for you. Um, in 1916, Woodrow Wilson, President Wilson, is going to make that our national anthem. Today you can go see the original flag, actual, uh, the Star Spangled Banner. And so when we say the Star Spangled Banner, lowercase, we're just talking about the general flag, uh, you know, a, a flag that has the 15, 15 stars. Uh, but we, when we say the, like capital T, the Star Spangled Banner, we're talking about this particular flag. Um, today you can go to the to the uh, American Museum in uh, Smithsonian in Washington D.C. and you can see the flag. Um, and so there's a couple of kids standing there and they're looking at the original flag. Um, and you're like, oh man, look! And the original flag, goodness, it's got all these at the bottom. It's it's all these tears and there's a missing star. And wow, so like the you know the rockets and the red glare and the bombs bursting in the air. And and but that flag was still there. Oh, it's like a, it's, it's like a poem. It's like a song. Huh, interesting. Uh, no, the, the flag didn't, the, no, it wasn't destroyed because of the, uh, the battle. Uh, a lot of people just decided to take souvenirs and cut pieces of the flag. And somebody actually cut out one of the stars uh, to take home. So if you happen to know, you know, if you're going through your, you know, your grandparents, great, great, that's great, 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 great grandparents attic and there's a cloth of a, blue or white star with a blue background. It might be that. Anyway, so, but you can go see the original, so that's kind of cool. Uh, museums. All right, moving on. The final battle of the War of 1812 for us, well, for everybody, is the, is the uh, Battle of New Orleans. And so we have this young, upstart, brash, cocky Indian fighter. His name is uh, Andrew Jackson. And he's going to lead the troops, the American troops. Again, the, in the south, the British are going to try to cut off New Orleans so that we can't, we can't uh, well, we can still send stuff down the Mississippi River, but then they get, it gets captured by the British. And so it's a good plan by the British, and they're going to send 8,000 troops, yep, 8,000 troops to attack uh, New Orleans. Excuse me. So on January 8th of 1815, 
various stories tell us that um, it was very foggy, um, it was bad, bad visibility, and Andrew Jackson kind of understood how it worked down there in Louisiana, <laughs> and, and all the swamp fog, and so he had his troops ready, so when the fog basically lifted, they were ready, and the British were still kind of standing around with their fingers up in their nose, uh, not ready, and so uh, Andrew Jackson ordered uh, to open fire, and it was, uh, gosh, it was a slaughter. Um, all, uh, Andrew Jackson's troops had dug ditches and uh, moats and things like that, and the British who were, the British uh, who survived the first salvo raced after the Americans who were retreating, and then they didn't, they didn't bring ladders or anything or bridges to, to it was just a disaster from the point of view of the British. So, uh, let's see, the British 2,400 either dead, wounded, or prisoners, 2,400, and the Americans had 13. So it was a huge win for the United States. <clears throat> and Andrew Jackson becomes this super guy, super general. Now, the crazy thing about this is that uh, the most famous battle of the War of 1812 was fought after we signed the peace treaty. Awkward, because the Treaty of Ghent was signed over there in Europe in, uh, let's see, December 24th, December 24th of 1814, uh, John Adams leading the, the uh, American delegation. So <laughs> we signed a peace treaty the day before Christmas, that'd be Christmas Eve, and the Battle of New Orleans was January 8th. And you're saying, but why, why would they still fight the battle? But you guys already know, because you know they didn't have cell phones back then. They didn't have, uh, they didn't have radio, and they didn't have whatever to get from point A to point B. So it took time for information to get there. And so uh, both sides, the British and uh, Andrew Jackson's forces, they still believed they were in the war, and they, they weren't. But it is what it is. So the Treaty of Ghent was signed and then ratified by our Congress in, uh, on, in February. And so the short version of the Treaty of Ghent was, here you go, status quo antebellum. Status quo antebellum. Bellum means war. Ante is before. Status quo means the same as. So the same as before the war. <laughs> so, so the Treaty of Ghent basically said, all right, Everybody goes back to their original corners. We're not going to redraw any maps. We're not going to do. We're not going. To, we're not going to give anybody extra land. We're not going to give anybody extra. Nope. We're going to go back to exactly like it was before. So like right before we declared war in 1812. That's what it's going to look like. So the question about who won the war. Well, I don't think it's a question. Um, it was a tie. It was a draw. So, because nobody gained anything, uh, we could argue that maybe the British lost more people, um, but we could argue we lost more buildings, right? And so, I mean, just kind of, it's a, there you go. Not that people and buildings are equate, equated, but you know what I'm saying. So there you go. It was a tie. So if you say, hey, the Americans, we won every war we've ever fought in. Well, no, no, no. We, we tied that one. So now we're 1-0-1 one, oh, one as a country. All right. <laughs> this Canadian writer, he, uh, he writes an interesting little piece of this paragraph. I'll read it. It says, Pierre Berton, because he's French, because he's Canadian, so he's Berton. Uh, Pierre Berton, Canadian author, wrote of the treaty, quote, It was as if no war had been fought, or to put it more bluntly, as if the war that was fought, was fought for no good reason. For nothing has changed. Everything is as it was in the beginning, save for the graves of those who, it now appears, have fought for a trifle. Lake Erie and Fort McHenry will go into the American history books. Oh, what can we just, we just talked about that. Uh, Queenston Heights and Chrysler's Farm into the Canadian. Yeah. 
<laughs> but without the gore, without the stench, the disease, the terror, the conniving, and the imbecilities that march with every army. There you go. That's what happens when you tie. And we've been best friends ever since. Us and the British. The Hartford Connection in 1814 is kind of interesting. Uh, the, uh, the New England uh, states are going to get together in Hartford, Connecticut, and they're going to make some demands. Some of their demands include financial compensation from Washington, Washington, D.C., <laughs> not George Washington, he's been dead for 15 years at this point, uh, because of the embargo, uh, abolition of slavery, oh, okay, abolition of slavery, the President of the United States is limited to one term, Interesting. Uh, abolition of the three-fifths uh, clause for, for slaves. Prohibition of election of two successive presidents from the same state. Huh. So Virginia can't have more than one at a time. Because, let's see, Washington's from Virginia, Adams is from Massachusetts, Jefferson's from Virginia, Madison's from Virginia, Monroe's from Virginia. Ooh, Virginia, they're looking good right now. How many from our state? Uh, awkward. <laughs> anyway, Massachusetts connected Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Vermont. So, but they're going to say if if you guys don't if you guys don't uh, we're talking about the, the Congress, the United States Congress. If you guys don't uh, accede to our demands here, well, we might we might actually start thinking about secession. The New England colonies, uh, the New England states, are going to uh, we're going to form our own country. That's an interesting idea. That the New England countries were the ones who started talking about uh, secession. Because you know it's coming, right? Convention issues his own report. Oh, but oh, goodness. And then we find out Andrew Jackson wins in New Orleans and that they're going to have a peace treaty. And it all falls apart for the New Hampshireers <laughs> and all those others. Now, the Hartford Convention. Uh, so here we have the various delegates from the from the uh, New England states, and they are jumping into the bosom of the king, who says, "Please, please come to me." And so, uh, there you go. So the results of the war, right? The results. It's a small war when it comes to the idea. You know, when we're talking about the large wars of the world, and it was insignificant in military terms. However, it did show the world that the United States were going to stand up to the big boys. You keep impressing our sailors, you keep arming the Native Americans, we're going to come after you. So, there you go. We are. We're going to put on our big boy bridges. Native Americans east of the Mississippi River are no longer a major uh, military threat. And so now they're no longer a military threat. What are we going to do to the Native Americans? <laughs> we're going to keep pushing them west. The idea of secession is now out there, right? We just said that. And uh, Andrew Jackson becomes a, demi, a demigod. Oh, Andrew Jackson, he's so wonderful. He, he won. He, he beat the British down in New Orleans. And he's going to do some other stuff. And then he's going to become president. And then things are going to get crazy. Uh, the rush bogo Agreement limits naval armament in the Great Lakes. And, probably most important... For basically the next hundred years, from 1812, 1814, 1815, when we signed the peace treaty, we are basically going to stay out of Europe's business for the next 100 years. So, even though uh, George, is, George Washington's been dead now for 16 years at this point, uh, we are going to follow one of his mandates that says stay out of European business. And we're going to do this for 100 years. I mean, not totally out, but we're not going to get involved very much with uh, Europe from point A to point B. And in fact, the next time we get involved in Europe, if you say, for, well, let's see, in 100 years, that's 18, uh, 1815, so that'd be 1915. What's going on in 1915 in Europe? <laughs> All you world history people, you're like, oh, yeah, I know what's going on. All right, and America looks inward. Let's see. We're going to end this video, and I'm going to get this uploaded. And we'll move on to nationalism in here in a second for the second video of this week. All right. See you in a little bit. Be good.